And here we go. Looking inside the heart that is uh, pumping blood, see the little web kind of stringing little, it looks like cheese strings on the top? Those are the chordae tendinae. The chordae tendinae are very small, stretched out portions of the heart muscle on the inside wall. They keep your heart from actually um, exploding from very extreme contractions. They are what allow your heart chambers to not overwork your body. All right, um, in this case, uh, pulmonary circuit, uh, blood flow again, the pulmonary trunk is what divides into the left and right pulmonary arteries. The arteries, um, you know, um, basically take the blood that's going to the heart, to the lungs, I'm sorry. Pulmonary arteries, remember this, is blood traveling to the heart, because pulmonary means lungs, to the lungs, because pulmonary means lungs. Let me say it again. The pulmonary arteries are what takes blood from the heart to the lungs. The word pulmonary means lungs. You have a left and right pulmonary vein. What do they do? Well, the blood gathers into there through the left atrium once it returns from the heart. Pulmonary veins deliver into the left atrium. Blood from the left atrium passes to the left ventricle through the left atrioventricular valve, known as the bicuspid valve. So as you notice, the right side had the tricuspids. The left side of the heart has the bicuspid valve. And they do the same thing. They keep blood from backflowing. The left ventricle holds the same volume as the right ventricle. However, it is much larger, muscular, is thicker, stronger, more powerful. Uh, this is what pushes all the good blood to the rest of the body. Cannot have any love without the LV. Um, blood leaves basically through the ventricle, through the aortic valve. In other words, for this page, remember this. When the good blood is pumped out of the left ventricle, it will lead through the aorta, the largest blood vessel of the heart. The aorta delivers the blood to the rest of the body's organs. Uh, the right ventricle wall is thinner. The, um, it develops less pressure than the left ventricles. And the right ventricle is pouch-shaped. In other words, the right side of your heart um, is more stretchy. It, it gets more powerful um, reception of blood. And if you cut this heart into a sagittal view, you can see the different sizes of the heart. As you can see, the, um, the right ventricle has thinner muscle walls, whereas the left side of the heart has thicker because it's pumping it to the entire body. There's a good view of the left and the right ventricle. As you can see, one side is thinner, the other side is thicker when it's dilated and contracted. The coronary arteries are made up of a left and a right side. Um, during high blood pressure, elastic rebound forces through the coronary arteries stretch and contract. The right coronary artery supplies blood to your right atrium and different portions of the ventricles. Uh, the left coronary artery supplies blood to your left ventricle and your left atrium and the interventricular septum is what divides the ventricles and the atriums. A normal artery on the left is made up of certain layers called the tunica media, tunica externa. These are layers of your artery. Now on the right side, you're asking for a heart attack. The narrowing of the artery resembles fat or atherosclerosis. This is lipid depositing of plaque, which is bad. You know how you can get plaque on your teeth from not brushing? Well, plaque in your arteries is fat developing and can cause a narrowing of your heart, which is bad. Stop eating all that french fries and soda, McDonald's, and smoking cigarettes. So, let's talk about diseases. Heart disease can be in so many different ways. Your basic coronary artery disease is when people have a blockage of coronary or circulation stops happening. Cardiac muscle cells need a constant supply of oxygen and nutrients. If you don't have this, you can have coronary ischemia, which is partial or complete blockage of your arteries. All right, angina pectoralis or pectoris is one of the common symptoms of CAD, and it's a painful, sharp um, pain in your heart. This is, uh, in most common form, a temporary ischemia, this an angina pectoris. Um, some people think they're having a heart attack when it's really not, but it's not a great thing either. So it reduces, you know, any, um, any feeling of normalcy because you can have any cause, emotional stress, any stress that's causing um, deep pain in your chest, you probably have trouble breathing with this condition. This is a heart attack, myocardial infarction. This is on your test. Make sure you know this fancy medical word. MI, or heart attack, is the actual heart being plugged and blood stopping. It's like a traffic accident, traffic jam. Nothing's getting through. This is your basic heart attack caused by stress or fat deposits. All right. 
Um, you can go ahead and read about this myocardial infarction in detail if you wish to. There's several things here. Um, treatments of this. About 25% of these MI patients die before obtaining medical assistance. That means when people have heart problems, they should go see a doctor. 65% of these deaths occur to people under the age 50 within an hour after the initial infarction or the stress. Uh, how do you treat this? Easy. Stop smoking. Um, stop drinking alcohol. Make sure you know your high, uh, if you have high blood pressure, you got to start taking medication. Do your diet. Stop eating all that fatty foods. Stress. Get away from all the people who stress you out. And start exercising. These are all tidbits on how to prevent heart disease. Um, drug, intra, drug intervention. Um, don't worry about this page, but I want you to know that when you do have a, a sudden heart attack or you feel like it, ad, uh, not Advil, but aspirin, like Bayer's aspirin, has been researched to slow down or to help um, reduce the impact of a heart attack. So if your grandma, grandpa, someone you know is having a heart attack, give them aspirin immediately. All right, skipping this. Um, oh, angioplasty is a procedure of the heart where they actually cut the heart open and they put a plastic balloon in there. The balloon then opens up and it pushes against the fat. Basically, it's cheating and it's squishing the fat that's blocking the artery and it, it's called an angioplasty because it opens up the vessels and blood can flow. You can also have a bypass surgery which where doctors open your heart up and they will go ahead and they will connect a clear route or a clean artery to one that is um, very bad or damaged or replace it. And this could be a single, a double, a triple. Scary, it could be a quadruple bypass surgery. Um, you don't want any one of these, but uh, get the more, the worse it is for the person. This is a normal heart on the left, and on the right is one with a serious heart disease. As you see, the openings are narrow, Compared to the left side, the rows are much larger for the blood to travel. The cardiac cycle begins with the SA node. The sinoatrial node is uh, basically the first action potential to start a heart contraction. An electrocardiogram is something that we use like a heart x-ray. And you can get that in a hospital or a normal yearly checkup. Okay, all right, skip this page. Um, this is how the sinoatrial node occurs. Basically, if you go through these steps, you'll see that the pulsation of the electricity is going through the chambers. Um, all right, you need to know these words. Bradycardia is abnormally slow heart rate, like person meditating. Tachycardia is someone with an abnormally fast heart rate, and it's going really too fast. An ectoptic pacemaker is what's used to um, maintain abnormal cells. It generates a high rate of action potentials. And it's really bad because it disrupts and can bypass your circulation. So it's like a, almost like a heart murmur. Uh, the EKG or ECG is used to obtain electrical activity of your heart. Here's a good picture of this. Um, you go to the hospital and they put all these plugs on you like your computer. And it monitors your heart rate and circulation. This is how they read it. They have systole is the high peaks of the top marks. Uh, diastole means relaxed state. It's at the bottom chart. All right, don't need to know this page. Cardiac cycle is the cycle between the start of one heartbeat and the beginning of the next. This is between contraction and relaxation. Make sure you know this. Systole and diastole, very important. What is your normal blood pressure? Do you know? If you answered 120 over 80, you're a genius because a systole is contraction. It's the highest pressure you have. Diastole is the lowest contraction. That's when your heart is at rest. 120 over 80 would be systolic, 120 diastolic is 80. This is a good circulation of how your blood pumps. Um, if you wish to, take a good look at this. Um, I will not ask you specifics on this part for the test. Let us continue. Blood pressure is the amount of pressure in any chamber that rises during systolic volume and it drops during diastolic volume. Your blood flows from high to low pressure. It's all depending on the contraction and the rate your heart is at. About 75 beats per minute, the BPM is what the average heart rate should be. Um, but some people have been around 80 beats or so. Uh, a heart murmur is a condition where sounds produce a regurgitation through the valves. 
when doctors ask you to take a deep breath and they have that you know cold stethoscope on your chest, they're listening for like a dub dub, but it's like kind of off, and the heart sound is like it sounds a little bit um, muffled up. Like when you hear things underwater, you know how things are sounds very unclear underwater. Well, that's what a heart murmur sounds like. Uh, your cardiac output is your heart rate times your stroke volume. Uh, you will not need to know this any computations for the test. Hormonal effects. Hormones we just talked about in the last previous test. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, thyroid. These three hormones have an effect on your heart rate. Uh, end diastolic volume and stroke volume. Uh, end diastolic volume is low. This is when you are really not doing anything when you're resting. However, when you exercise, your systolic volume or EDV increases. That makes sense. If you're resting, you're not gonna heart, your heart rate's not going to be crazy. If you're running and you're exercising, it's going to be rated really fast. Okay, um, some physical limits of your heart. The ventricles can only expand and they are limited by the size of the muscle or the myocardial tissue. The actual skeletal fibrous chordae tendinae and the sac that's holding it, which is the outer membrane, the pericardial sac. Uh, the Frank Stalling principle just says that as the end diastolic volume gets larger, your stroke volume increases. This is common sense. The more blood you need to enter to do an exercise, the larger the pumping of the blood into the artery. Common sense. Okay, end diastolic or end systolic, not end diastolic, but end systolic, totally different word, systolic volume, is the amount of blood that remains in the ventricle even at the end of one uh, contraction. So it's like when you take a puff of air and you breathe out, there's always a little bit of air left in your lungs that you can puff out. And that's what end systolic volume is. All right, we have ended this chapter right now. When I return from my uh, exchange program in Italy, we will discuss some more things in detail, but please go over this video or these groups of videos and make sure you read the entire chapters for 19 and 20 and do the uh, assigned homework or the assignments during class. Good luck to you and God bless.